pre rocket science. Hello, guys. Hope you guys are all well and safe. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering, and Design Engineering are really excited to host the fourth talk in our annual guest lecture series, which runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings. Um, tonight, we're really excited to host Simon Gwads, all the way from Singapore, CEO and founder of Equatorial Space Systems, with a talk titled The Tesla or Rocketry, How ESS Revolutionizes Space Access. So details of Simon and the talk were sent to your emails ahead of the lecture, including links to social media pages like LinkedIn, Facebook, alongside the Equatorial Space website as well. So feel free to connect with Simon online. And Simon, it's all yours, ready to go. All right, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to share more about our work with you guys. And uh, essentially what we are working on uh, is rocket systems which are simpler, safer, and more cost-effective compared to anything else available in the market right now. Uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with recent developments in the space tech industry, uh, well, satellites are getting smaller, satellites are getting cheaper, and they are getting more accessible. And uh, that is driving a massive market demand for a, for a agile launch opportunity. And by agile, agile I mean uh, launch services which offer uh, specific access to, uh, to, uh, to, or to specific orbits and uh, are also responsive to the client's schedule. Uh, so this is essentially the market which we are currently involved with. So, uh, okay, is it okay if I screen share? Yeah, that's totally cool. You can go for it. Ahmed? All right, perfect. Okay, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay, so uh, the future of rocketry is, well, I dare to say drastically different compared to what we are seeing today. And uh, you know, before we actually jump into the uh, the whole idea of space and rockets and launching of satellites, you know, for us, us uh, for as long as we are still, you know, keeping our feet on the ground, let us let us talk not about rockets, but let us talk about cars and automobiles in general. And uh, we've seen some really exciting activity in the automobile landscape. In the past uh, 20 years, we've seen the first major car maker emerge with a completely different approach to what was, was traditionally done. And uh, of course, no, sorry, my slides got a little scrambled. And of course, that's Tesla. And the funny thing about Tesla, I mean, really impressive, in fact, is the specs you get for the price. If you look at Tesla Roadster, that thing is going to get you from zero to 100 km per hour in less than two seconds which is faster than Bugatti Chiron, right? And uh, the catch is that Bugatti costs you $3 million and Tesla Roadster that's coming up is tentatively priced at 250,000. And now you might be wondering how is that even remotely possible, right? And it really kind of boils down to the technology and its simplicity. So if you look at Bugatti and uh, internal combustion engines, uh, well, they are madly complicated. You guys are the design students. You know how complex, uh, you know, engineering design can really get. And especially things like internal combustion engines, you know, they really boggle my mind every time I look at them. Compared to, te to that, Tesla is, well, very straightforward. It only has a few electric motors and the battery pack. And that's essentially uh, the, the baseline for the drivetrain. And uh, that is, well, lighter. It's simpler. It's uh, well, aside from the batteries, of course, it's cheaper to make. And uh, this is basically the same effect that we want to achieve with rocketry. So I'm not sure how much do you guys know about rocketry, but let me give you a, a little crash course in rocket science, you know, to the best of my ability right now at 1 a.m. Singapore time. Uh, so all rockets carry oxidizer and fuel. That's what they mix together and uh, combust together to produce thrust. And thrust is needed to build up velocity. Velocity gets you above the atmosphere. That's the first step. And after that, you have to continue burning your engines until you build, build up sufficient velocity to actually enter an orbit, if, you're, if that's your goal. So in case of solid rocket motors, uh, you can think of them as giant firecrackers, essentially. You premix oxidizer and fuel. Uh, one of the most common combinations of that is this rubbery substance called HTPV, hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene mixed with ammonium perchlorate, which is the solid oxidizer. So essentially, it's a very straightforward system. Uh, at the center, you will have this thing called the port, which you can see right over here. 
And that is where the combustion takes place. And that's where uh, the exhaust gases are being produced. And later they are just driven through a you know, typically convergent divergent, diver, divergent nozzle, at which point uh, you, uh, you basically produce choked flow and therefore you achieve supersonic exhaust gas velocities. So it's very simple in its principle. The problem with solid rocket motors, which, are, which aren't quite often used in commercial applications, is how dangerous they really are. We're talking high powered explosives. In, in many cases, we're looking at multi, you know, uh, at tens or even hundreds of tons of high powered explosive. So even though solids are simpler compared to, to other kinds, they are not necessarily cheaper. And a fantastic example is actually a European launcher called Vega, built by the Italian company called Avio. Uh, so Vega costs around uh, 40 million euros for launch and it only car uh, carries around 1.5 tons of payload, which, and it's, it's basically almost as expensive as Falcon 9, which carries uh, almost 20 tons. So uh, it, even though solid motors are simple, uh, they're also dangerous and also inflexible. There is no way to actively throttle them in flight. You can do some tricks by adjusting the geometry of that opening in the center, which we call the port, and uh, therefore modulate the, uh, the surface area exposed to combustion throughout you know, at, at various phases of the burn. But there is no way to actively throttle that if you need to do it in flight. Also, it's very difficult to shut them down. It's, it's theoretically possible. Uh, some uh, ballistic missiles, I believe, are capable of doing that. Essentially, you have to blow off a, a hole in the entire engine uh, housing to, uh, to, to achieve this blow off effect and reduce pressure until uh, to the point when the combustion actually stops, which is not very practical for com you know, commercial companies, especially ones which are working with unlimited budgets. It's, it's just really, really not as easy as it seems. On the other side of the spectrum, we have liquid fuel rocket engines. And the principle of operation for those is that you carry oxidizer and fuel, as the name suggests, in a liquid form. A very common combination is liquid oxygen, abbreviated as LOX or LOX, and kerosene, a refined form of kerosene, basically. So uh, to actually supply those things into the combustion chamber where the explosion takes place and therefore the exhaust gases are produced and directed through the nozzle, there are two ways to redirect, I mean, to, to, to deliver those substances, either through a pressure feeding system, which requires uh, much more robust tanks, which can actually survive substantial pressures and, they're, and they are therefore heavy, and it's not a good idea for a rocket to be heavy, or more commonly for at least first stages and you know, so-called boosters of launch vehicles, you'll typically see a very, very complex turbopump machinery. In fact, that is the most expensive part of a liquid fuel rocket engine. Uh, a typical turbopump will set you back by at least half a million bucks uh, if it's lightweight enough to be rated for flight. And uh, well, the beautiful thing about liquid propulsion is that it's very, uh, I mean, considerably more flexible. Uh, a liquid rocket engine can be throttled. So it can be used for more than just, you know, this first initial phase of flight when you're just building a velocity like crazy. And it can also be shut down or restarted if the design allows for that. Uh, majority of companies developing small launch vehicles right now are working with liquid fuel engines. Uh, of course, they are really complicated and therefore it's not cheap to really build them and get them to work in a reliable manner. Uh, but this technology is quite well established. So we can think of this as really your internal combustion car. You know, it's an established technology. There is, a, in, in certain countries like the US, there is a lot of expertise in building them, but still they are not cheap. They can be made better and they are still susceptible to a lot of things which can go wrong. We're talking about lots of moving parts here. You guys are the engineering students. You know very well how difficult it is to, to get something with a lot of moving parts to work reliably. So therefore they are not a perfect solution either. So what fewer people are aware of is existence of a third type of chemical rocket engine, which is called a hybrid. So in a hybrid, as the name suggests, you, care, you basically deliver liquid oxidizer to a combustion chamber where the fuel is already stored in a solid form. And then that is basically when the combustion takes place and when the exhaust gases are produced and directed much the same way through a convergent divergent nozzle. So the idea here 
is that both of these uh, substances are stored in two different states of matter. And what this gives you is a system which is fundamentally non-explosive. The solid fuel itself is inert. It's very straightforward to manufacture, very straightforward to, uh, to, uh, to transport and store, and it's safe to operate. That is the, best, the biggest advantage of hybrid rocketry. And uh, yeah, as, as, you can, as you can see, you know, in theory, you, all you need is really a valve to control the oxidizer flow. And as a result, you can control you know, the throttle or you can shut it down if necessary. In fact, NASA was exploring use of a hybrid for this uh, space shuttle solid rocket boosters, but they couldn't really get it to work because of the fuel technology limitations which were previously uh, affecting this kind of uh, propulsion architecture. Uh, so this is something which we'll be getting to uh, shortly. But first, let's take a look just how, just how safe hybrids are compared to other kinds of rockets. I know this is not the best thing to show to people, uh, you know, rockets blowing up, but, uh, you know, it, it, it will really prove the point. So this is Falcon 9. That's in 2016. Uh, what happened here, the, 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 the pressurizing uh, helium tank, which was inside of the oxidizer tank of the upper stage, just came loose. Uh, it basically pierced through the engine, uh, through, through, the, through the second stage skin. And you can see what happened yourselves. It basically just blew up on the spot immediately. So yes, liquid fuel is still quite risky. You know, there's still a lot of things which can potentially go wrong. And when they do, it's, it's typically very explosive. Conversely, right over here, uh, we see an example of a solid rocket motor explosion. Uh, that's a Delta II. It's a NASA built rocket base in a, not built, but operated rocket back in the 90s. Uh, so you can see this stop footage and uh, yeah, you can see just how quickly this explosive effect is actually taking place. And that's basically it. So uh, yeah, doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence, I know. So this is an example of a hybrid. It's a company called Amrock, the American rocket company. They were one of the pioneers of uh, you know, commercial use of hybrid rocket motors. And uh, you can basically what happened here is that they had this uh, additional supply of hydrogen peroxide for thrust vectoring control. Uh, basically they would inject it straight into the nozzle to, to add a, a little extra, extra uh, moment in terms of the uh, flame geometry coming out of the nozzle and therefore control the direction of the flight. Unfortunately, their valve got stuck. Uh, there was an excess amount of hydrogen peroxide just burning through the motor. And at the same time, uh, you know, basically the uh, oxidizer flow was also stuck and the, uh, the, the rocket thought it was in flight. And that's why you can see all that, you know, hectic attempts at thrust vectoring. They were using liquid oxygen. They were, their valve got basically froze up. As you might know, liquid oxygen is really cold. But you can see, even though it's burning up, you can see that black smoke, that's basically the engine housing and the insulator are already on fire. It's not actually exploding. And even, you know, granted, that thing basically topples over at the end, but the damage to the, to the launch structure was, uh, was in the order of a few thousand dollars. Unlike in case of SpaceX, in which, you know, the facility had to be fundamentally uh, revamped. So even if something goes wrong, hybrid is what you really want to have. It's it's simply not as explosive. So, uh, so yeah, you can see even after it topples over, it still doesn't blow up. It's just like, uh, you know, just a piece of inert material on fire. So now you might be asking me what many of our investors are initially asking. If hybrids are really so great, then why is not everyone building them all the time, right? I think you can somewhat see where I'm getting to, you know, with, with this earlier comparison with electric vehicles. You know, there, is, there are some inherent advantages to building a hybrid. Are, uh, it's simply simpler. And, uh, not as comp and, and not as prone to uh, multiple uh, kinds of, of, uh, of malfunctions as, uh, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as you know, internal combustion engines really are. So this is where we're getting slowly to, uh, you know, towards right here. So let's look at the fuel options which were traditionally available and how do we solve that entire problem? So if you take things like HTPB, which I mentioned earlier, which is very commonly used in purely solid rocket motors. And if you don't mix it with an oxidizer, and if you just use it as a fuel for a hybrid, people have tried that, people are still trying that. And uh, well, the problem is 
it doesn't burn very quick when it's not mixed with oxidizer because the combustion only happens at a very thin film layer uh, inside of the port. And uh, of course, if there is no oxidizer premix into it, it doesn't really expand very quickly. We call this uh, the regression rate of the fuel. Uh, so one of the ways to, that companies and organizations alike try to overcome this problem with was by adopting those very complex geometries of ports, have multiple openings running through the entire length of the solid fuel. And the idea was that if you do this, uh, you are going to have a greater surface area exposed to flame, which makes perfect sense, right? Unfortunately, this leads to uh, a number of issues. So the first issue with this system, with this kind of approach towards uh, traditional polymer fuels such as HTPB, is, well, it, it basically reduces the volumetric efficiency of the rocket. You have to increase this, uh, the cross-sectional area of the stage to accommodate the same amount of fuel. And that, that induces extra drag. Again, not a great thing to have in a rocket. Second problem is that to maintain a structural integrity of the solid fuel it, with so many different openings with this you know, cartwheel configuration, if you will, you have to use a support structure inside of it, which not only increases the mass, which is again, a very bad thing for a rocket. You, know, you want to be as close to you know, perfect ratio of dead weight to actual fuel as possible. Uh, it also impedes with the actual combustion effect, right? The, the, basically the, the combustion layer, that film which is, which is actually burning is impeded by the support structure. And therefore you actually have a lot of leftover fuel at the end of the burn. And, uh, you know, if you're building an amateur rocket or an academic rocket that's just supposed to go up and down, you know, you can live with that. But if you're trying to, uh, um, if you're trying to build an orbital launcher, if you, if you suffer from loss of fuel to the magnitude of 15 to 20%, you're not making it into orbit. You're not going to build up sufficient velocity. Right, I just realized a little, uh, I skipped a little important element just for those of you who have uh, maybe slightly less, uh, you know, exposure to fluid mechanics and, uh, you know, engineering as a whole. Uh, the problem with lower aggression rate is that you suffer from lower mass flow rate. This less fuel basically burns up and gets ejected through the nozzle and that affects the thrust and, th and thrust affects the thrust to weight ratio. So in, in, in case of a single port configuration, this simply doesn't produce enough thrust. Uh, that's the issue with it, and that's why uh, there have been those attempts to resolve that by increasing that entire uh, surface area exposed to combustion. So uh, this didn't really work quite well. It could, it could be done, but it would not be a very efficient rocket. You have to have something which is drastically oversized for the amount of payload you want to carry. So uh, some institutions decided to give a shot to paraffin wax, literally paraffin wax as the solid fuel. And uh, again, paraffin wax is very easy to procure. It's safe to handle. Uh, it's available anywhere in the world. Even in Singapore, we, you know, there is absolutely no problems procuring any of it. Uh, and uh, you, you might know how restrictive Singapore really is in terms of explosives and you know, anything really. And uh, the problem with paraffin wax was the combustion stability. Uh, so paraffin wax liquefies itself, which was the very, uh, the very objective of, of using it on the first place, because that increases the, uh, the regression rate. And therefore, you do have a higher flow rate and therefore a higher thrust. Unfortunately, paraffin wax doesn't bind into anything, really. Uh, and it's also, and then because of this, because it doesn't really hold its own structure very well, uh, the moment you expose it to heating, it starts to slump and change its entire geometry. And when paraffin wax changes its geometry, when you know, it, it basically when you when you start having this entire slumping effect going on inside of the engine, you will start to experience mass ejection of the fuel. So for a different reason, but you are still going to end up losing around 15 to 20 percent of your solid fuel. In this case, not to uh, the, the you know the sliver. Uh, as in the case of polymer fuels, but to the fuel just flying out of the engine and combusted, right? So that's a big problem. Not only it reduces your efficiency, it also introduces a lot of, uh, of, of thrust fluctuations, which is another very bad thing for the entire rocket and the payload. 
So uh, there are some ways to try to, to basically, uh, you know, improve that structural integrity with paraffin wax. You can premix it with some some other substances, but then again, you start losing regression rate, which defeats the entire purpose when you do that. Also, paraffin wax shrinks quite a lot when uh, during the curing process after it's being casted. So uh, to avoid any cracking or any uh, you know undesirable effects on the, uh, the the geometry of it, what you have to do is basically use this process called uh, the rotational molding. And rotational molding essentially involves like a centrifuge, which basically just keeps spinning until the whole thing just settles in place. And you know, if you try to mix it with anything that's energizing it, like aluminum powder, again, very commonly used in rocketry, uh, it's very, very difficult to get it uh, evenly distributed in this system. Uh, so again, paraffin wax did not exactly solve that problem. Even though uh, there's been a number of experiments trying to tame paraffin wax, no one has been successful so far. And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, but you know, so so as as you can probably imagine, we we basically uh, developed our own fuel combination, which is our core IP, and uh, this is why we are confident we can make hybrids work, and therefore we can become the Tesla of rocketry by introducing a system which is much simpler and uh, you know fundamentally uh, effective compared to what's been done before. So this is one of our uh, previous engine tests which we have done. It's a pretty small motor, but uh, you can see that the flame geometry, you know, the shape of that entire plume doesn't really change a lot. It's very, very nice and stable. We did have some, uh, you know, we can see some sparks here and there. That's because we used a very substandard aluminum powder. I can disclose that, but, uh, you know, because that's not the core uh, chemical composition that we are using. That's just an additive. And uh, well, it's, it's nice and stable and we have trust curves to prove it. This is what NASA has been doing with paraffin wax. This is the Peregrine motor, uh, which was uh, which was built by the Ames Research Center in California. And you can just, just take a look at, uh, yeah, just be your own judges. Not sure how, you know, if it's lagging or anything, you know, through Zoom, but you can see there's a lot of instabilities going on. And even though NASA spent close to a decade developing all of this and trying to get it to work in a reliable manner, they just couldn't do it because of natural, uh, because of natural tendencies of paraffin wax. So uh, this is really the core change that we are intro introducing compared to anybody else. Our fuel, you know, depending on the oxidizer delivery system that we use, produces uh, performances very comparable to that of solid and liquid fuel and uh, fuel systems. We only have around 4% leftover fuel at the end of a burn. It's structurally stable. We can only use one single port and we don't have to worry about slumping effect and the regression rate is high enough for us to do just that. We are actually using a non cryogenic oxidizer to go with that, nitrous oxide. We'll be chilling down to around minus 60 degrees to densify it you know, to close to uh, liquid oxygen density levels. And uh, as a result, we have a system which is actually scalable all the way into orbital uh, grade launchers. And uh, this is really the core differentiator that we've got and uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about the complexity of what we are working with. So I know this is a pretty extreme example of what a liquid uh, fuel rocket engine looks like. Uh, this is what SpaceX uses on the Falcon 9. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's rocket science, you know, it's, it's crazy complex. Uh, it's an open cycle engine. You can see those little nozzles sticking on the side. This is basically a piece of, uh, that's known as the gas generator right over here. Uh, it takes a little bit of oxidizer, a little bit of fuel to basically spin the turbine, to, uh, which supplies the, the main uh, feed lines with uh, under correct pressure. It's yeah, it's it's really not easy to build that stuff. But let's look at slightly more modern, uh, you know, more relevant examples. So this is what Rocket Lab, a, a New Zealand company, is using on the uh, Electron launch uh, launch vehicle, uh, which is operated currently from New Zealand. And uh, their key innovation was, you know, they had the right idea. They wanted to simplify the whole thing. They were successful with it. Uh, they, instead of a turbo pump, they decided to go ahead with an electric pump. That was their key innovation. But take a look with, on, uh, at our design. <laughs> you know, compared to hundreds of thousands of parts for Rocket Lab, which is already quite straightforward, we're looking at using fundamentally less than 20 individual parts, you know, minus the thrust vectoring system, of course. But it's, it's going to be very, very straightforward. We are currently developing this full-size motor and we'll be using a block of four of them for our launch vehicle, which is going to be comparable in capacity 
to what Rocket Lab is doing. Uh, to give you a little extra idea, what can we do with this, with this technology and how does it compare in terms of development costs and the price point? And uh, this is a very, very uh, generous budget. We are confident we can complete the entire R&D for uh, substantially less than that. Uh, so Rocket Lab spent around $120 million developing the Electron, which is already not bad at all, especially for people who still you know, dwell on the Apollo era budgets. Uh, so they've done a, a fantastic job. Uh, that's as cost effective as a liquid, uh, you know, propelled launch vehicle can really get. They can carry around 120, 140 cap kilograms to into low Earth orbit, depending on inclination and altitude. And uh, they're pricing this at around 6.6 uh, 6 million USD right now. We're going after the very same market niche. Uh, so uh, very similar payload capacity. But our development costs will be basically one, uh, one fourth of that. And uh, the price per launch will be substantially lower as well. We're looking at 4.5 million and that's, uh, you know, we, we, that actually includes a, a very healthy profit margin. So uh, thanks to the technology, we can produce a much more compelling product. And this is where we, you know, this is why I like to compare ourselves to, to Tesla really in that sense. So also, uh, you know, just to give you an idea where the hell would, would we be launching from, uh, Singapore is close to the equator. It's a good place to launch orbital rockets from. You get a little extra payload capacity because of the additional rotational velocity of the planet at this point. And uh, at the same time, you actually get to launch in any direction, you know, in any, into any orbital inclination as you wish, which, uh, which actually allows extra flexibility to clients. Sea launching has been done by a number of entities before. Recently, the latest entrant to that is actually China. What you can see on the lower right corner over here is the Long March 11 launcher. They've been doing those tests in the Yellow Sea. And uh, well, in our case, that's really an added bonus, but the core of the whole deal is really the technology. So where are we currently? Uh, so this is what we call the low altitude demonstrator. The moderate firings that you saw just now is for this particular thing. Uh, it's designed for a pretty modest apogee, but we did it on a really low budget. So uh, it's really just a stepping stone for, uh, for fundraising. And uh, I can also proudly announce we are finally back on track with our test flight. It was supposed to take place in Malaysia early this year, uh, in May or June. But because of this entire clown show with COVID-19 and the travel restrictions, we were unable to do it, of course. Uh, so we'll be moving towards a test flight in December this year. Uh, we're currently making uh, necessary preparations and uh, you know, I'll make sure to drop you some of the flight videos once we, uh, once we have them. Hopefully everything's going to go just fine. All right, and uh, yeah, just to get, you know, link back with the example in the first place. What, Rock, what SpaceX and Rocket Labs are doing are the internal combustion engine cars. Complex, but very well established. And what we are working on is a little like an electric vehicle. You know, we did not invent a hybrid rocket motor. We don't make that claim, but electric, and, and neither Tesla invented the electric cars. In fact, electric cars have been around since the 19th century. They, everybody knew their potential advantages in terms of simplicity and mass and, uh, the, the problem was always the battery technology, the energy density, uh, which affected the, of course, power output and the range. And uh, that's where the, the key innovation really came from uh, when Tesla came around. Uh, usage of that novel battery technology to, uh, to uh, produce competitive electric vehicles. And HRF-1, which is our fuel solid fuel, essentially is to hybrid rocketry what lithium ion batteries are to electric vehicles. That is the value of what we've got. And we plan to take it all the way and develop a company which will compete with, the, with, with the, the biggest and most established players in the launch landscape. We can do it. We have a strong differentiation and we will produce rockets which are safer, simpler, and more cost-effective compared to anybody else. So if you're interested in staying in touch, uh, we are currently not hiring. Uh, we are still fundraising basically. So unfortunately this, this has to wait a little, uh, but we are keeping a, a register of interested people. So if, you, if you'd like to get involved, do add me on LinkedIn, uh, do follow us on social media and uh, 
do send us your CVs to uh, careers at equatorialspace.com. Uh, we might be doing more work in the UK coming up uh, in, in, in the near future. In fact, we're looking at it as one of our uh, potential bases of operation. And uh, well, looking forward to uh, meeting you guys. And uh, you know, thank you very much for your kind attention. I know it's a pretty chunky presentation, uh, but I don't think you can explain this in any simpler terms. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to your questions. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Simon. That, sure, that was uh, super, super interesting. And thanks, thanks for the science behind the rockets as well. Just, just a, a question um, when I was reading your biography earlier, how did you get into uh, you know, um, propulsion and, and um, propulsion systems? Hey. Yeah, uh, I get this question a lot. So uh, I think there are two answers to this. Uh, first of all, I really have to blame uh, Tom Hanks uh, and Ron Howard. I grew up watching Apollo 13 on a loop I can't. I don't know how many times I've seen that movie, and uh, you know, it, it just really never, never left me. And uh, you know, I think everybody has a phase in their lives when they are quite fascinated with uh, rocketry and space. Uh, it's just that some of us refuse to grow up, really. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of them, clearly. Uh, but yes, uh, to give you a little more in-depth, uh, you know, uh, back origin story. Uh, so when I started university, I was actually not from an engineering background. Uh, but I decided to basically start to self-study the fundamentals behind the behind propulsion and behind orbital mechanics. And at the same time, I began to volunteer with a local space industry association here in Singapore. And I could actually speak to people developing satellites. I could validate some of my ideas, get a lot of corrections along the way uh, based on the real life experience. And as a result, uh, you know, the, the idea for equatorial space was born. Uh, I, I'm not the engineer myself. Uh, in fact, we have one of the top propulsion engineers in hybrid rock, uh, propulsion worldwide, Mr. Jamie Anderson. He's got 30 years of experience working on those systems, and he is the inventor behind HRF1. So, uh, you know, I also don't want to misrepresent myself that I came up with all this stuff. I did not. Uh, I was just lucky enough to rope in the right people to, uh, to put together a, a crack team. Amazing. Uh, th thanks. Thanks for that. Um, a few questions coming through in the chat as well. Um, if you were to hire someone or you know give an, an internship, what would you look for in a, in a candidate? Okay, uh, very good question. So, of course, uh, bulk of what we do is in one way or another involved with either hardware engineering in terms of like PCB design and uh, and uh, you know integration of various electronics. Of course, mechanical design. Uh, and there's, there's quite a bit of software as well for engine controls and for, uh, for the GNC, the guidance navigation control uh, element of it. Uh, the but, but, but that said, we, I do know people who have been uh, from slightly different backgrounds, like from material science, from uh, general design fields, uh, who learned the necessary uh, you know, relevant knowledge uh, pretty quickly and were able to contribute in very meaningful, uh, in fact, you know, some, some key ways. Uh, I would say the most important quality that we are looking for in people is, well, being able to solve problems on the fly. Uh, so any form of hands-on experience is invaluable. Uh, some of the best engineers I, I have in, on the team uh, have been involved with things like, uh, you know, race car development over back in university. Uh, so aside from their coursework, they had a lot of experience with like actual hands-on problem solving. I think that's, that's the most important quality. Amazing. And, and all of the guys in the room uh, that you guys do a lot of learning um, through doing and through experiential practice. Right. So like uh, hopefully that philosophy will translate in terms of being able to, you know, adapt and be flexible. And yeah, yeah, that's right. Another question Absolutely. coming through from uh, Demi Banjo is uh, what quote do you live by as a rocket scientist? OK, uh, so again, I'm not a rocket scientist. Uh, I'm an enjoyer, you know, if not uh, a casual fan uh, and uh, really a you know, full time founder of the startup. But uh, I would say Robert Goddard, uh, you know, it's difficult to say what's impossible because, you know, what was impossible yesterday can be a reality tomorrow. You know, I'm paraphrasing this, but, uh, you know, you really have to uh, to look into the future in this field. It takes a quite a long time to get to the, uh, you know, to the launch pad. <laughs> no pun intended there, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely I'm right. 
as Samuel Cabrera mentions, uh, what would you say is the, the most favorite thing about your your position and your job? Oh, uh, well, I would say, you no. Know, in the, uh, in the normal times, it's actually the the, uh, the opportunities to, to meet really incredible people uh, when traveling and conferencing and uh, networking with people. I had a chance to meet Tom Mueller from SpaceX, uh, the chief engineer uh, for SpaceX, uh, which basically built all of the rocket engines. Uh, that was an incredible experience. He was such a gentleman and uh, such a such a kind person, really. And uh, I get to, see, uh, you know, I, I would say this this is really the, the the favorite part. And of course, okay, second favorite, the f- absolutely best part. You know, no comparison. We have we haven't done that, you know, in the last few months for obvious reasons. But uh, it's the engine testing, or you know, soon to be soon test flights as well. Uh, you know, for those of you who have not had a chance to actually witness a rocket engine test on the, even on the ground attached to a test cell, I suppose majority of us, you know, haven't had the chance just yet. Uh, you know, once you hear that sound coming out, once you, once that shockwave hits you, it's, uh, it's just incredible. You know, it ruins you for life. There is nothing else that comes close to that. Even with a pretty small rocket engine, it's just so powerful. Awesome. And uh, Luca Tribuio, he mentions, uh, what's the difference in payload capacity between your rocket, which cost, uh, which would uh, set you back at 4.5 million and the uh, other one that's priced at 6 million? Okay, Luca, now we're talking. So we're looking at uh, pretty much the exact same capacity uh, as the Electron. Uh, So uh, the price differential will be, you know, uh, proportional to... uh, uh, to that launch price because we're looking at a very, uh, you know, a, 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 it's a substantially lower price per kilogram in this sense. Uh, but that said, uh, we might be able to, to price it lower as we continue scaling up production. Uh, of course, uh, economies of scale is a huge consideration in terms of manufa- mass manufacturing of simple rocket motors. Uh, so we might be able to drop that uh, substantially lower. Amazing. And Brady Hansen, uh, feel free to go live. Uh, you wanted to ask a question live, feel free to unmute yourself. And there you go. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the talk, Simon. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, I just uh, was wondering what your sort of like testing, research, and development process is like um, as you go through different chemical mixes or different, uh, you know, mechanisms for valves and flow. Like what, General, I mean, okay. I know you can get really specific, but what's the what's your development process generally like? Okay, so uh, so for the fuel, I'd rather not disclose too much uh, because it's a proprietary, you know, uh, trade secret com- uh, composition. Uh, but Jamie was the one to develop that, so uh, if, uh, you know, he'll be the, really the best person to uh, to ask. Uh, in our case, you know, the, the baseline, uh, you know, fuel comp- composition is already in place. So once we settle on uh, on a development process, you know, we have uh, the key parameters which are already known, uh, such as the pressure coefficient and the regression coefficient. So once you know that, you can actually do a very uh, straightforward modeling of, uh, of how wide does the port have to be, how long does it have to be, and how, how many seconds do you have to burn this for uh, to produce sufficient performances and sufficient impulse. So once we have this very basic analytical model, which is basically, uh, it, it can be done in a spreadsheet actually, it's, it's really straightforward, then we jump into the design phase. Uh, so of course, when it comes to the uh, like valve design and the oxidizer delivery system design, it's very heavy on the Bernoulli principle. Uh, so uh, again, it's nothing that's that's outside of a scope of you know, maybe postgraduate uh, kind of kind of person to really get a grasp of. Uh, and of course, we have to validate things during uh, what we call cold flow tests. So uh, once we have the entire oxidizer delivery system in place, which is designed for a specific uh, uh, for a specific motor, for a specific flow rate and supply pressure, uh, then we basically have to conduct a number of tests to make sure that we, we are basically discharging things at the correct rate. Uh, so the best way to really go ahead with, with this uh, is by using a Coriolis flow meter, which we currently don't have because they are pretty expensive. Uh, but if you, if you do that, it's pretty straightforward to uh, characterize the injector and uh, introduce any necessary modifications to it. Uh, and once you're confident with the performances of the, of, the, uh, of the oxidizer delivery system, you can jump straight into, uh, not straight into, but you can move towards hot fires. Uh, so that's, that's where fun really starts. Uh, we basically uh, bring those units into a secluded enough location 
and uh, we basically run uh, the entire sequence with the ignition going on, and that's when we uh, we are actually able to uh, to test the the thrust by determining what's the mass differential between you know, before and after. And uh, by measuring thrust, we can determine what's the specific impulse. You know, essentially, what's the exhaust gas velocity? So, uh, so it's a pretty straightforward arithmetic at that point. Great, thank you. Amazing. And Vladan Gerbrich, he mentions uh, and he asks, why do you think big companies may be reluctant to embrace new technologies? Yeah. So, uh, okay, that's really uh, that's largely caused by the fact that. Uh, you know, it's not impossible for a big company to come up with what we did, but they are pretty uh, confident and pretty comfortable with what they already have. You know, ultimately, if you're NASA or if you, if you're Lockheed Martin, then uh, you know you, you really have something that's that's already working. So uh, so there is this uh, lack of incentive to actually create something that's that's more cost effective because you already have it. Uh, another problem with larger companies is you know, especially in context of the defense ecosystem. And space tech is very closely related to to defense ecosystem. Is the contracting model really the cost plus contracting, which further disincentivizes innovation and uh, you know uh, cutting costs because you don't really have to worry about that. In fact, you know the more costs you add up to to your program, the better. Uh, so that's another consideration. Uh, in a in a specific context of hybrids, the reason why uh, I mean the HTPB was one of the commonly uh, experimented with fuel is really the established supply chain. It's just already there. You don't have to develop any new supply chain to manufacture a different kind of, for in, this, in this case, fuel, for instance. So it's really the, uh, the confluence of an established uh, supply chain of the uh, you know, experiences and expertise of the core engineering staff, which is already you know, comfortable with what they know and probably slightly reluctant to change that. And as well, uh, you know, and, and also it's a matter of the you know, business strategy that company retakes. Really if you're a small startup, you you want to jump into the market as quickly as possible and innovate if if it means that you can reduce costs. If you're a conglomerate, you don't have to do that. Amazing. And Aurel Marianne asks, uh, is there a place um, where you, we can find the information that was uh, mentioned in this presentation? Like, is there a shareable PDF or a YouTube channel or on your website? Uh, okay, so uh, yes, uh, some of the core information are on the website. Uh, of course, we don't talk about Teslas over there. Uh, we don't currently have a YouTube channel, but we have the firing videos over at our uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn pages. Uh, so you can stay in touch with us. And uh, basically, the, the, the high-level information is already included over there, including the, uh, the innovation strategy pertaining to our solid fuel. Awesome. And a question from Farhad Khan. Um, he's seen a company called Relativity who makes 3D printed rockets. What's your view on 3D printed rockets? And will your company okay. like to do this? Yeah, so Relativity is actually one of the most prominent uh, examples of a, uh, you know, something that started as a, as a pretty small company and grew to, uh, to a substantial size. Uh, They're based in, uh, in, in LA. And uh, yeah, so this is actually a very interesting example of, uh, you know, of the kind of innovation strategy that many companies in this field currently are actually following. Uh, there is actually more than 120 different companies, you know, with, uh, which at least expressed an interest to develop launch systems right now, because the market for launch is just so huge. Uh, but you can see that very few of them introduce any substantial innovation in terms of the propulsion architecture. Majority of them, and uh, Relativity is the absolute flagship example of that, are focusing on the manufacturing. And uh, additive manufacturing it does have quite a bit of potential. Uh, in fact, Relativity's main motivation is uh, you know, developing technology that will allow manufacturing of rockets on Moon and Mars. So that's why they are so hell-bent on making the entire thing 3D printed. You know, in our case, we don't really see a reason to do it. Uh, in our case, uh, you know, we'll be very uh, dependent on, on processes such as filament winding for the uh, comp compressed gas over wrap tanks. Uh, we will most likely end up 3D printing some of the flow control system components, especially the, uh, the injector elements, which require a high degree of, of precision. But for the rest of the structure and the rest of the uh, entire system, we just don't really see a need for it right now. Uh, it's, you know, our systems are just easy enough to manufacture with, uh, with subtractive methods right now. 
but I do think that the 3D printing is a very promising thing, and uh, it's something that we are we are currently exploring as uh, you know as as we move forward. Amazing. And Mohammed Alam, he asked a question: um, Have current rockets at that scale considered nuclear nuclear reactors as a source of electrical fuel? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, you might be referring to uh, okay. So rocketry is is actually split up into a few different categories. Uh, so when it comes to uh, you know burning things chemically uh, like oxidizer and fuel uh, to produce thrust, that's what we refer to as chemical rocket engines. And they are furthermore split into uh, you know liquid, solid, and hybrid. And there's also monopropellant thrusters, which are just 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 running a specific gas through an, a catalyst to. Uh, to, to, to cause this exothermic reaction in them. Uh, in, you know, nuclear propulsion is an interesting concept, but uh, it's, it's more on the electric side of things. There are, there's in fact a few different ways to use a nuclear reactor on board. One of them is just to superheat uh, a gas such as hydrogen to, to generate uh, you know, much higher chamber pressures compared to what a chemical rocket engine can produce. But unfortunately, they would on, I don't think they will be very practical in terms of their trust to weight ratio. So they will be they will be amazing in orbit for like things like interplanetary transfers. They would not be very practical for launch. So I think launch will still remain uh, the territory of chemical propulsion. Really, uh, there is another way to use a nuclear reactor, and uh, that's basically by fueling you know a, a whole effect thruster or any form of electric thruster. I know absolutely nothing about those, <laughs> so you know sorry to disappoint you. And Nav Navpreet mentions, um, you, you mentioned that you're currently raising funds for your company. So yep. where, where do you raise funds from? Who do you mainly get your source of funding from? And like, uh, what's the process? Yeah, so, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is basically part of my job. Um, yeah, so we've had some uh, investments from angel investors, which are essentially private individuals who are interested in a specific industry and they do see a potential in a particular business and uh, its technology. And currently we're actually in the process of raising our first inst institutional round through, uh, from a venture capital firm, which is just exponentially more difficult. Uh, they require plenty of, uh, of substantiated information pertaining to the budgets, pertaining to the valuation of the company, pertaining to market research, uh, and uh, ideally also they would like to see uh, uh, revenue and you know market traction which in our case it's a little early but we are discussing our first commercial contract right now with a European client for a suborbital rocket which we are developing as well you may find out more about that one on the website it's going to be ready next year uh, but essentially yes uh, you know the, the entire due diligence process is time consuming it requires multiple meetings, which all have different spin and different focus area. And uh, you know, if if you're curious to find out about the human experience of fundraising, yeah, sometimes you know, if it wasn't for the specific area that we are working on right now, I I, I am tempted to just jump off a building. You know, <laughs> whenever I go for a for an investor meeting, it's just not fun. It's like a job interview, but times a hundred. Awesome. And a question coming in from Harry Miller Adams. He's asking, uh, okay, we, what, would you, what would you be doing if you were in our position now um, in terms of getting that a step ahead of everyone else? Okay. Uh, so if you're looking at doing something in terms of space, uh, like uh, in, in terms of entrepreneurship uh, in space tech, um, okay, you know, I, you know, lots of people say that launch is really oversaturated right now because there's just so much activity going on. Uh, I'm not so worried because most of it is is going to uh, to to run into the same obstacles as everybody else. You know that comes with using heritage technologies. Uh, so you know, I, I wouldn't want to discourage people who want to start a launcher startup. I think there's still a lot of potential ways to innovate. We just don't know exactly where. Uh, and you know, you know, I've been discouraged really, and you know, we, it's, it's working so far. So it, you know, if, if that's something of interest to you, then I, I say by all means, uh, give it a shot. Uh, furthermore, away from launch, there is a growing interest in uh, cis lunar space right now, uh, and the Artemis Accords, which were also signed by the UK, uh, will offer a lot of of commercial opportunities with the moon. Uh, you know, business to government kind of opportunities for now and before they actually start being commercialized for, uh, for you know, business and individual users. Uh, I've recently seen news that Nokia was actually selected to provide 
you know, uh, mobile connectivity on the moon in the next one decade. Like, it's absolutely insane. <laughs> it's uh, and incredibly exciting. And I think, uh, you know, I would say people who are just getting started, I would say, you know, if you're not already in a place like that, do my no, do move some to to a country with a very established space agency with uh, with strong interest in research and in development of new technologies and in exploration of space, and look towards the moon and beyond. It's the point to really start doing that right now. If you want to, uh, you know, if five years from now jump into where the market will actually be, right there right then, or, you know, in the next seven years, for instance. Amazing. Andres Yusuf Romero is asking, uh, how can we come and watch the launch live? Okay. Uh, I will try to stream it. Uh, I don't promise it's going to work out. Uh, the place where we'll be at is a, a palm oil plantation in Malaysia, uh, pretty far away from any city. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure what, what the quality of connection is going to be there right now. You know, maybe we could use Starlink for it, but <laughs> I don't think they have licensing for ground stations in Malaysia yet. Awesome. And, uh, Mohammed Alim, um, continuing his, uh, question on the nuclear reactor as a source of fuel. Um, he, he said, uh, why don't companies consider this as a source of fuel in space and use harmful, instead of using harmful fuel substances just for launch? Yeah, so it really boils down to the trust to weight ratios you get from nuclear systems. Now, actually, there's been quite a bit of work done on that. Uh, even back in the 60s, uh, the project called NERVA, I have no idea why NASA gave that up. It was really exciting. It was working very well on the ground. I, I think one of the concerns was really the risk of launching a nuclear reactor with fissile fuel, uh, you know, with, with on a... You know, launch segment in general right now has around 6% failure rate. You know, it's not as safe as, as, as commercial flying, you know, nowhere near. Uh, so I think the, the environmental concerns of launching, you know, fissile material is just really quite a big concern. Uh, yes, uh, some, there are some, you know, radioactive substances being launched on probes which go into, into deep space. But they are not reactors. They are basically just RTGs, radio uh, thermal elect. Uh, sorry, uh, what was it called? R radio isotope thermal electric generators. They basically use slow decay of a substance to uh, to induce thermal electric effect into the uh, the power collectors, and uh, they do carry small amount of radio radioactive substance. But it's not uh, you know anywhere near the grade that you use in a nuclear power plant. Uh, so I think, you know, even in case of a launch failure, it's simply not going to produce a lot of additional pollution, you know, especially spread around a large area. Uh, so yes, I would say, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I sidetrack a little bit. Uh, uh, so, okay. Yes, so yes, you, you could use them in space. In fact, they will, they will definitely be used in space at some point. Uh, but even for the upper stage, you know, you're still trying to build up that velocity as quickly as possible. Uh, and therefore you still need a substantial amount of thrust to weight ratio. You need to build that within, you know, five to 10 minutes after the boost phase and actually enter on orbit. Otherwise you're going to re-enter. That's why I don't see them useful even for upper stage applications right now. Uh, for, yeah, for, for transfers uh, outside of low F orbit, Definitely. I think there's a massive potential in nuclear uh, propulsion. I, in fact, I'm a huge fan of that idea. I think if, we, if, if NASA didn't give up on that, you know, who knows where we would have been by now. Amazing. And um, Joseph Salem, building on that, he asks, uh, in terms of using a nuclear reactor, would this involve plutonium in the process? Uh, yeah. So again, I'm not an expert in uh, well, uh, nuclear uh, you know, engineering. Uh, but yes, I believe so. It could be plutonium uh, or anything that's currently used in you know, commercial nuclear reactors, really. Uh, yeah, so uh, it would actually involve something that's, that's you know, potentially highly radioactive, which is, which is a concern. And Luca, uh, and Luca Trevio, he, he mentions that if a new kind of technology for pro propelling rockets popped up and it seemed to be better or more efficient than yours, would you keep on developing yours or start investing in a new technology? I would say yes, I'll keep on, uh, because again, you don't know until it's actually flown. So even if something that's very promising shows up, and uh, you know, I do track activity in this, in, in this business, uh, you know, the, first of all, there's no one size fits all solution. You know, hybrids are great if you're building a, a cost-effective small launcher. 
uh, it's not going to be the most effective solution if you're trying to build a heavy launcher with reusability in mind, like Falcon 9. But then again, you're, it's, it's like a lot like comparing you know, a Learjet to a 747. They are just working with different market niches. So uh, th no, that itself is, a, a, is one of the reasons which I, which I don't panic with someone show, new shows up. Uh, and if someone came up with something very, uh, very interesting, I would keep my eyes on it, but I would, you know, you know, one of the jobs of a CEO is not to panic, you know, keep your eyes open, but, but keep steady and, uh, you know, have, have trust in your, in your technology and your team. And if you really see something wrong, then yes, you know, if, if, if at one point we basically really cannot get any more for the traction because someone with drastically better, uh, approach showed up then we would change our entire business model and uh, you know, look into something different. Amazing. And talk with us, uh, you want to go live if you're still around? Uh, of course. Yeah. Great uh, up hi, with us. Hi, Long time no see. Hello, good to see you. Uh, look, so my question would be actually about the Starship. So the Starship, mm -hmm. uh, to those who maybe don't know about it, is basically a super, super big rocket with, made by Elon Musk by SpaceX. And the idea behind it is to bring us to uh, the moon and later on to the Mars. But the unique thing about the Starship is that is most public development process of the rocket ever. We can yeah. see weekly updates from YouTubers about every single part of hardware which is put inside that rocket and the rocket facilities around. So my question would be uh, for you as a rocket developer, uh, as an entrepreneur and everything else do you follow it and what are your thoughts oh, yeah. because ula and other traditional uh, american ones uh, they use this all the polo style approach where you try try check check uh, check 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 before doing anything and S starship seemingly use a russian old style soviet uh, <laughs> methods. yeah build explode build explode what would you use and what is your advice for us as designers uh, what methodology for not even for rocket projects, but for any kind of project is better to try, try and think or actually do an explore thing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sure, man. Uh, yeah. So uh, it really depends on the on the on the situation. You know, I know it's a it's a pretty, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, it's a non answer, basically, but it really depends on your priorities as a company on the kind of project you're working with and uh, the degree of confidentiality we want to maintain. So ULA is a great comparison with SpaceX because they, you know, they have a very method, meticulous approach towards developing and uh, manufacturing the rockets and launching them. Uh, in fact, they, are, uh, they have, I, I believe, if not 100% and very close to uh, a reliability rate, clo very close to 100%. Uh, which is crazy high, basically, but they are very expensive as well. So what ULA really, you know, where they position themselves is the prime contractor for sensitive missions. You know, whether sensitive from the national security perspective, because, you know, once you put together a satellite worth a billion dollars, you really want to make sure it gets into orbit. And, uh, you know, ditto for, the, uh, for scientific missions for NASA. Again, uh, scientific missions are on order of magnitude more expensive than commercial satellites. So, uh, you know, for SpaceX, for instance, they wanted to be more cost effective, you know, especially in the beginnings, because they, uh, they did not have the kind of street cred that ULA had. Uh, but in the end, yes, Falcon 9 became a, uh, the workhorse of the industry. You know, they, they worked out. They actually got it, you know, uh, crew certified, which is incredibly difficult. And, uh, you know, it worked in the end. They basically had to take this uh, slightly different approach to arrive at the same destination. Now, regarding Starship, um, I think the reason why they are very public with this is because of just how inspiring the project is. Uh, it's supposed to be our ride to Mars, to Moon and Mars, really. And it's, uh, it's just a part of their public relations strategy to keep it very open. Also, uh, the the, you know, my opinion is that the success of you know, Starship testing does not actually change their, uh, their commercial standing because it's currently not one of their you know, lead commercial products. Falcon 9 is already very well established. So even if something goes wrong, it doesn't affect their contracting process for commercial launch with Falcon 9. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why they are so uh, open and so upfront. I don't think any investor would be happy with a, you know, with, with a startup you know, or, or an early stage company being as, uh, as transparent. 
I just don't see, you know, that kind of uh, situation being, rel you, know, uh, you, know, you know, happening the same way as with SpaceX right now. Amazing. Thank thanks a lot, Simon. Thanks a lot for all of the, the questions and your time. It's 2 a.m. Sure. now. In My pleasure. And you yes, know. it's been a long day. <laughs> During this era in, okay, maybe in just one one last question. I, I like this one actually. Uh, okay, so launching from higher altitude will it help to reduce the fuel required to reach orbit? Uh, okay, this is a great one. Uh, I love that question because it there's just so many ways to answer it. Yes, so absolutely, uh, you save yourself altitude and you get some additional velocity, which is why air launching is more efficient. Also, most importantly, and this, this is something that, that uh, not, not many people are, are, are as aware, is air launching is actually very efficient in terms of the nozzle uh, performances. You know, nozzles are much more efficient in vacuum because there is no uh, ambient pressure impeding the, ga the exhaust gas flow. And therefore, you actually produce a higher specific impulse and you know, basically higher exhaust gas velocity and therefore ISP in, uh, you know, at higher altitudes. So actually, you get up to save a lot of performances because of that effect. The issue with uh, higher altitude is, you know, unless you have, you're somewhere in high mountains, like really high mountains, which does impose a logistical challenge, is that air launching is really expensive. And, uh, you know, I was giving an example just now with uh, Rocket Lab spending $120 million on the Electron. Uh, Virgin Orbit spent over uh, 700 million USD so far on the Launcher 1, which uh, had one test flight, which was unsuccessful, not, an, not, a, not, not really a shock. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's way, way, way more expensive. We're talking about operating a fleet of aircraft or at least one aircraft, uh, you know, operating, uh, you know, maintaining the crew, maintaining the airframe and, uh, you know, getting it certified for flight on the first place, which is all really taking a lot of money. Uh, so yes, it's, it can be done successfully. Pegasus, uh, built by, eight, uh, by, I think, Orbital, uh, back in the like, 80s, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, did become a very uh, successful product. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really expensive. It's it also costs close to I think forty million US per launch at this point. So yeah, it can be done. Uh, it does offer you some a lot of benefits, but it's also uh, you know just for practical reasons, it's, it's it's basically very expensive. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Simon. Sure. Again, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. So for, from all of us at Middlesex University, product design, product design engineering, design engineering. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks for your time. And yeah, we, we look forward to seeing the progress of, uh, and hopefully the launch of your- uh, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you guys posted. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, yeah, thank you so, and you know, all the best.